Today we are looking at perhaps one of the most iconic early jets that were developed in the post-World War II era. It was a small, fast package with heavy firepower and it could wrestle with the very best the West had to offer, the MiG-15. Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am your host Bismarck and today we are in Berlin Gatto in the Militär Historische Museum of the Bundeswehr taking a look at the Soviet Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-15. Now this jet of course rose to international fame during the Korean War when it was employed amongst others by North Korean forces. Its battles with the American F-86 Sabre have become a source of aviation folklore in a sense and of favorite discussion as well. Reason enough then to take a closer look at an aircraft that has become a legend. Nowadays the MiG Design Bureau is well known. After all it produced some of the most prominent jets used by the Soviet Union during the Cold War and it continues to play a role in contemporary aviation as well. Just after World War II, however, this wasn't the case. Artyo Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich had formed their company in 1939. But the only MiG aircraft of that time that we commonly refer to is the MiG-3. And as a high altitude interceptor, the MiG-3 really was unconventional for a Soviet Union that favored low altitude air superiority fighters. In the field of aviation, however, a spark of the unconventional is sometimes just what is required to make a difference. And after some experimentation with high speeds design, MiG stood ready to start thinking about using a new propulsion system, the jet engine. Seeing the developments in Germany, of course, before the end of the war and the introduction of the first jets, for example, in the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union turned to their own design bureaus and essentially told them to come up with a competitive jet that could provide an answer to the Western counterparts. And really it's a mistake to think that the Soviet Union had not experimented with jet engines up to this point. The first turbojet was in the works in early 1941, but that work was interrupted due to the German invasion that very year. Not to be picked up again until 1944 when the war's end seemed guaranteed. Yakolev, at that time known for Yak-3s and Yak-9s, initially got the better deal in the Soviet Union, being supplied with the German Jumo 004 engines. But Mikoran and Gorovich were not out of the picture yet, and they soon stood at the epicenter of a new exciting era in Soviet aviation. The MiG-9 became the first jet attempt there, but one limited by a whole range of problems. But hey, it was nonetheless promising. The main issues that plagued the Soviet designers at the time were, well, on the one hand, a lack of a powerful jet engine. And on the other, the necessary experience when it came to actually designing jet aircraft, which were of course very different to the more orthodox piston aircraft. They were fast learners, but for now, they were lagging behind. And now comes an episode in aviation history that really has puzzled many. Mikoyan and Klimov, the man behind Soviet aircraft engines, well, they went shopping abroad. The question now, of course, was who would give the Soviet Union a working jet engine? With every passing day, it became more obvious that East and West were at a standoff, politically, socially, ideologically, and militarily. Surely no one in the West would be happy to pass cutting-edge technology to the Soviets. Well, apparently Britain thought otherwise, having already made some deals with other countries for their Rolls-Royce Durban 1 and the Nene 1 and 2. The Soviet Union was just another customer on that list. And from a total of 55 engines bought, the Soviets themselves successfully reverse engineered their own designs. In 1947, MiG constructed their I-310 prototype, known as the S-1. 
The S2 and the S3 follow, testing out the design and the engines, adding speed brakes, improving the cockpit, featuring progressive changes to the tail, the wings, and incorporating the first weapon placements and hard points. By 1948, the aircraft was christened, the MiG-15 and mass production was slotted to begin. In December of that year, the first MiG-15s were rolling off the factory lines, powered by the RD-45F, a copy of the British Rolls-Royce Nene II engine. While the Soviet Union had fixed its engine problems, courtesy of the United Kingdom, the MiG-15 still had many problems, oftentimes mirroring those other countries like Germany and Britain had to overcome themselves a few years prior to this. High-speed control was difficult, the gear was too rough, the trim tabs were insufficient, the fuel system was problematic, battery power was limited, pilots didn't like the cockpit button layout, and training, of course, of aviators only commenced very sluggishly. But these problems, they could be overcome, and they were overcome relatively quickly, and the MiG featured many systems also appreciated by the Soviet pilots, such as improved radio sets and a blind landing system, the OSP-48. The progressive changes to the design on the production line, very much sort of a Soviet-style work method, produced some confusion then and even now on the specific marks of aircraft, and it was also a very sort of disjointed, costly procedure. To give you an example, the cost of a MiG-15 built at number one factories in nowadays Samara cost about 430,000 rubles. At number 153 factory, situated in the middle of nowhere really, uh, the cost of a near identical ship was about 650,000 rubles. Now every time a modification was made, it had to be sent out to all the relevant factories. And today we sometimes make the quick distinctions between the MiG-15 and the MiG-15 BIS. But really of all the MiG-15s, uh, offers like, for example, Gordon, uh, identifying like 20 different main sub-variants. Uh, so that gives you sort of an idea how much of these progressive changes and the numbers of the different versions out there. And that's ignoring the different offshots of other nations, such as, for example, Poland and Czechoslovakia, that also produce these machines. The UTI MiG-15 we have here is a bit of a special case, mainly because of its appearance right next to the Sabre that we have right there. And that makes it look so, so very tiny and compact. But hey, these are actually known as midgets. In any case, it's a general trainer aircraft built to train new pilots. And in broad strokes, it really does feature the same equipment as a standard Dash 15 with slightly lighter armament. Now, since the MiG-15 also received an ejection seat, the Soviet Union decided to purpose-build several UTIs into what is sometimes called a trainer catapult. Ejection seats were, they were a novelty really to Soviet pilots and pilots everywhere at the time. And the Air Force feared that this lack of confidence that the pilots had in the ejection seat would provide a mental obstacle that would prevent a pilot from blasting himself out of the aircraft in an emergency. And to overcome this, the Air Force turns to a very hands-on solution, touring the different fighter squadron with UTIs, explaining the ejection seat mechanic, and then getting a few volunteers to try them out. The seat in question at that point had a reduced charge, by the way, to provide a more smooth ejection, and the confidence in this new equipment amongst the pilots rose. Sneaky, very sneaky. The MiG-15 was officially introduced in 1949 and would see a large-scale production order. Initially built in three different factories, it was soon built in about six other factories as well. In these alone, about 13,000 were built, and that is the, only the domestic production. In Poland, Czechoslovakia and China, further models were produced. And in the future, I aim to make a video about those specific aircraft too, but first we need to get our hands on them. So for now, back to the MiG-15. The aircraft is most prominently remembered for its role in the Korean War, and we will come to that in just a second, but it serves to look at the MiG's life from a macro lens first. Built from 1948 and introduced in 1949, it was put into operational service remarkably quickly, really, with the first combat-ready squadrons appearing in 1950. By 52, all MiG-15 units were ready. They had already appeared on parades, were deployed in East Germany, in Poland, and of course they also formed part of the Soviet Union's acrobatics team. The first trial by fire came in early 1950. 
The Korean War was still a few months away when Communist China asked Soviet assistance in countering the air raids by Nationalist China, now largely confined to the island of Taiwan. There wasn't really much to do, but the Soviet pilot scored three kills regardless, one of them being a communist Chinese flown triple F-22, mistaken for a Mitchell B-25 bomber. But the pilots did earn sort of their first taste of jet combat experience. And the MiG-15 would enter it into the Korean War in November 1950, after the initial North Korean offensive had been pushed all the way back to the Yellow River. The USSR and China jumped into action by providing assistance on the ground, and in the sky. For the MiG-15, the units sent to Korea were often meant to go to the European theater before that, thus this relocation did actually cause many of the initial plans that the Soviet Union had to be pushed back. Uh, Soviet pilots often flew uh, MiG-15s that were actually painted in North Korean colors so as to hide their involvement. They were also not allowed to cross a line between Pyongyang and Wusan or were allowed to fly over the sea. But word soon did get out the Russians, or the Soviets rather, were flying over Korea. The pilots were also required to learn some Chinese or Korean so as to mask their origin on the radios. And actually this seemed to go remarkably well until they got into contact with the enemy. And one pilot actually recalls that the broken Korean that they spoke at that time quickly became interjected with Russian swearing. So the order to only speak in Korean or in Chinese was very quickly withdrawn as being completely unrealistic. While they undertook combat duties, two of the initially three sent air divisions took on training duties for the Chinese and Korean pilots that were to be equipped with these aircraft. These pilots then were also very quickly pushed into the fighting and operated without the same sort of restrictions that the Soviet pilots had. This is also why the combat record of the MiG-15 is so spotty over Korea. When US jets like the F-86 Sabre ran into Soviet pilots, the fighting was usually fairly balanced, giving the advantage to individual skill or to whomever saw the other first. Against Chinese and North Korean pilots, this was often very different. Again, it's a matter of skill, context and a fair bit of luck as well. So when trying to look at air kill to loss ratios to find the better aircraft amongst these two, you'll find yourself staring down the wrong metric. Nowadays, we often remember that uh, fight between the MiG-15 and the new F-86s, but it also serves mentioning that initially the MiGs were fighting against F-51s, F-84s and F-80s. And there's always a bit of give and take on the whole, but against these older machines, this MiG was definitely superior. To this day, we're not really sure about the actual victories scored in Korea, each side sort of claiming their own numbers, both in internal documents and then of course those broadcasted to the outside. Um, one of the very first battles, for example, between Sabres and MiG exemplifies this perfectly. The US claims six shot down MiG to one lost F-86. The Soviets claim three Sabres to two MiG. Generally, the losses acknowledged on each side are more reliable figures. So perhaps in this instant it was US-2, USSR-1. We can speculate how all we want, however, and we will still be here in three weeks' time. Eventually, the Soviet MiG-15s were actually pulled back quite substantially for more training purposes. The Soviets acknowledged that the Sabre was a worthy opponent and that training would provide the edge. Pilots that had already fought in Korea were now parting their experience onto the young ones coming up. The MiG-15 itself had become subject of quite a lot of interest. Termed Smolyat Soldat, a soldier's aircraft, the Western Air Forces tried to get their hands on one of these. It managed actually to do so uh, with a few crash-landed ones, but it only got a working one when a Polish pilot defected to Denmark. Two weeks after the Korean War ended, a North Korean pilot also defected, cashing in a reward of $10,000, which he apparently didn't even know existed. While we can debate about the relative qualities of the respective planes, the reality is that the pilots made the best use of what they had and could they get their hands on. In the end, the outcome of any engagement really mattered more on the skill than any hard performance stats you might find on a piece of paper. The MiG-15 stayed in service for a considerable amount of time and was used by a large number of countries, most notably of course those of the Warsaw Pact, here we have an East German one, countries in the Middle East and the odd outliers like Finland, and surprisingly via the Chinese license built Shenyang, also the United States. 
It was later improved with the MiG-17 and saw a redesign with the MiG-19. It was used as a fighter bomber and auxiliary air asset. And in the new versions, it also saw service in much later conflicts like the Vietnam War, for example. The MiG-15 is a single-engine fighter built in a semi-monoc all-metal fashion out of Duralumin. The plane is built in two sections, separated at frame 13 to allow easier engine maintenance. The cantile lever mid-wing monoplane design is swept at 37 degrees, featuring hydraulically accentuated flaps and two boundary layer fences that you can see on each wing to assist plane control and stall characteristics. The aircraft has a length of 10.1 meters, it spans 10 meters, and it stands at 3.7 meters. Empty weight is around about 3,600 kilograms with a maximum loaded weight of around about 5,000 kilograms. And it is powered by a single Klimov VK1A engine producing 6,000 pounds of thrust, allowing it to reach a maximum speed of around about 1,070 kilometers an hour. And it does feature a heavy armament, one 37 millimeter Nudelmann cannon on the starboard side, holding 40 rounds, and two port side 23 millimeter Nudelmann Ricker and R23s, holding 80 rounds each. Now that's not a lot of shots, but if they hit, they hit. And in its later strike rolls, the aircraft was also armed with uh, bombs and rockets and hard points. And of course, it could also use drop tanks. So what we're going to do now is a little bit of a walk around, essentially emulating the pre-flight check that a pilot would do before taking off in a MiG-15. So you'd approach the aircraft from the front, you check the uh, general alignment of the wings that nothing is wrong there. You check the cover on top of it's properly latched. You check that the camera is not obstructed. Obviously the intake should be clear. You then move around to the starboard side. You check the gear. Uh, you make sure that the pressure, tire pressure is correct. You look that there is no uh, leaks in the, uh, in the hydraulics. Nothing is you know, bro obviously broken. Check the covers as well. Uh, once you're satisfied with that, you move on. Check the antenna. Check that the boundary layers are good. This little pin that's sticking out of the wing that actually shows you the gear is deployed. Um, it's a nice little indication for the pilot should the instrument in the cockpit fail. He can just look outside and you know he sees whether the gear is deployed or not. In any case, we move further along, making sure that all the covers are closed. The pitot tube should at that point also be cleared. So usually there's a cover. This can now be taken off. Move along the wing. Nothing's instructing the navigational light on the starboard wing moving forward, making sure that the uh, wing is nice and clear. You then have the ailerons, you make sure that there is uh, good movement on those, nothing is obstructing them. Same thing with the, uh, with the flaps, they are obviously now retracted as they would also be on pre-flight check. Uh, you just make sure there is no obstruction, nothing covering maybe uh, the aileron together with the flaps. You make a second check also on the gear here and the hydraulics and the ergonomics uh, there. Also looking at the wheel covers, you go back up making sure that all the covers that you see on the aircraft are fine. For example, over here, that would be housing part of the gyro compass. You'd also check the flare dispenser, white, red, green, and yellow. Coming down here, this is of course the air brake. You see it's slightly extended now. Just making sure nothing uh, is blocking it, that there will be free movement once you need them. Going over, you check the rubber, whether that is working fine. You also check the elevators that you have on top. Just making sure, again, free movement, nothing is obstructing those. You go further on, make sure that the engine outlet is clear. Second air brake, this time on the port side, make sure that that is fine as well. Cover, 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 just checking those again. Making sure then that the uh, flaps and the ailerons on this wing are also properly uh, moving. Uh, there's another cover right here, also for the hydraulics. You make another check on the uh, on the gear covers here, you make a check on the wheels. Again, tire pressures are properly, nothing is leaking, nothing is broken. So we go further along the wing, just general inspect inspection. Again, navigation guides must be clear. A little bit of acrobatics now as we go below the wing of the Canadair Sabre. Watch the pitot tube here. On the port wing, we will also check the landing light, which is currently retracted and we move up, we look here. You can actually see here how the entry uh, blockages are for the canopy. Anyway, we move up front again. At this point, we would also look at the cannons, make sure that any blockages of them 
are taking off. Sometimes also the ground crew takes that off just before uh, takeoff. You'll actually find this little spar here on the cartridge ejection slit. Uh, that just prevents the cartridges from flying out into the port wing. Since this is a UTI MiG-15, you only see one uh, port installed gun right there. And that's essentially our port, uh, our pre-flight check completed. At this point, I can board the aircraft, start up with the sequence, make sure that the ground crew is obviously giving me an assistance there, and off I go. The MiG-15 might not have been the first Soviet jet, but it certainly is the most memorable one from that early age of jet aviation. And its story is one of much as clever engineering as it is of scheming politics. And while it might present itself as a small diminutive package, it certainly had quite the punch. So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, please consider supporting us on Patreon to allow us to help fund these shoots. And you will also get exclusive behind the scenes footage from these machines and shoots. And I want to thank the Militär Historische Museum here in Berlin Ghetto for allowing us to get close with this aircraft. And if you want to visit them, check out the link down below as well. So as always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky. Just click on one of these.